Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the 34th International Churchill Conference. My name is David Freeman. Many of you already know me as the Director of Publications for the International Churchill Society, the editor of Finest Hour, our quarterly print magazine, which uh, goes out to all of our paying members, and also the editor of the Churchill Bulletin, our monthly online newsletter, which goes out free to anyone who wishes to subscribe and goes out to more than 35,000 subscribers each month. This year, as I was last year, I have the honor of being your program chairman, but unlike last year, I appear before you today with a clean heart and clean shaven. <laughs> Some quick housekeeping comments. Uh, first of all, the restrooms are located directly outside uh, the grand ballroom here. Uh, the Chartwell booksellers will be setting up in the Petite Ballroom next door and will have books available all day. Many of the uh, people speaking today and tomorrow have books available uh, for purchase. And also this afternoon, after the final session, we have a scheduled one-hour book signing from 4.30 to 5.30. So authors that are available, we ask uh, if you'd like, please be available for uh, our book signing this afternoon. Lunch uh, will begin at 12 today. Lunch is going to be a buffet that will also be set up next door in the Petite Salon, just like breakfast. Uh, but we'll ask you then to uh, bring your meal back in here as during lunch we're going to have two presentations, one from the National Churchill Museum at Westminster College in Fulton, Missouri, and one from the Queen Mary in Long Beach, California. As we did last year, we are going to be adhering rigidly to our timetable as a courtesy to our speakers, and so let us begin immediately. I have now have the privilege of introducing the Executive Director of the International Churchill Society and the Director of the National Churchill Library and Center in Washington, D.C., Mr. Michael Bishop. Thank you, David. Good morning and welcome to the 34th International Churchill Conference. We are pleased and honored that you can join us, especially those who have traveled a great distance to be here. There is a marvelous program in store for you today and tomorrow, and I trust you will find that the journey was worth it. For those among you who wish to tweet about the proceedings, our hashtag is hashtag Churchill 2017. We are met if the Londoners among us will forgive me, in perhaps the greatest city on earth, where Churchill's mother was born and his grandparents lie buried. On his first visit in 1894 and 95, he reveled in the hospitality and fell under the spell of Irish-American Congressman Burke Cochran, who opened his mind to the power of rhetoric. From Cochrane's luxurious Fifth Avenue flat, he wrote to his brother, this is a very great country, my dear Jack, not pretty or romantic, but great and utilitarian. 36 years later, he was to have a much less comfortable experience on Fifth Avenue. On December 13, 1931, the history of the world was very nearly altered forever when Churchill, following in the footsteps of countless British tourists, had looked the wrong way while crossing what was then a two-way street. He was struck by a car and severely injured, a dreadful development made worse by the fact that it occurred during Prohibition. His suffering doubtless would have been greater were it not for the tender ministrations of daughter Otto C. Pickhart, who provided this prescription. This is to certify that this post-accident convalescence of the Honorable Winston S. Churchill necessitates the use of alcoholic spirits, especially at mealtimes. The quantity is naturally indefinite, but the minimum requirements would be 250 cubic centimeters. But we have gathered in New York to consider an even more vital issue than that of Churchill's spirit rations. The theme of this year's conference is Churchill as International Statesman. At a time of tumult and tension in world affairs, 
with North Korea brandishing its newfound nuclear might, Iran continuing its campaign of state-sponsored terrorism, and the West riven by conflicting visions of how best to govern its affairs, Churchill's example is as vital as it has ever been. Journalistic references to Churchill are constant. His name and example are seemingly evoked on a daily basis in connection with world crises, sometimes in a way that reflects reality, and sometimes not. The prolonged and contentious Brexit negotiations, which have convulsed the Conservative Party more than any other issue since that of Ireland's place in the Union a century ago, have sparked new debate about Churchill's dream of European unity. And the present foundering of the government's Brexit plans on the issue of the Irish border have called to mind his invocation of, quote, the dreary steeples of Fermanagh and Tyrone emerging once again, unquote. In fact, the columnist Fintan O'Toole recently observed, if you write about Northern Ireland, you face heavy fines if you don't refer to Churchill's steeples. And so today and tomorrow, we will hear from a former British Foreign Secretary. We will hear about Churchill's complex relationship with Germany. And we will consider Churchill's nuclear statesmanship. We will consider his negotiating acumen, his relationship with his colleague and rival, Clement Attlee, and his many connections to Ireland. And we will hear about the way in which his vision of foreign affairs was colored by his sense of living history. We are particularly honored to welcome Lady Williams, who had the privilege of serving Sir Winston as private secretary in 10 Downing Street during his second premiership. We will also hear some exciting news from the Queen Mary, Churchill's beloved means of transport and an essential component of his international statesmanship. Sir Winston is not only the focus of renewed journalistic and political interest, in recent times he has, rather remarkably, become a fixture in popular culture. The recent immense success of the Netflix television program The Crown sparked a renewed interest in Churchill. Indeed, it was good for business. The show was as much about Churchill in his second premiership as it was about the monarch. Actor John Lithgow was awarded an Emmy for his portrayal, and he concluded his gracious acceptance speech just a week or two ago, in which he thanked a number of people by saying that he wished most of all to thank Winston Churchill. In these crazy times, said Lithgow, his life reminds us what courage and leadership in government really look like. The crown was only the start of the Churchillian pop culture renaissance. Perhaps the unlikeliest hit of the summer movie season was Dunkirk, a powerful, even visceral look at the Allied evacuation from northern France in May and June of 1940. Though Churchill did not appear in the film, his was the presiding spirit. And his We Shall Fight Them on the Beaches speech, read by an exhausted soldier, combined with a gliding spitfire a fiery sunset, sunset and the strains of Elgar to form the rousing climax of a great cinematic achievement. There was another film this year that featured a character called Winston Churchill who, in the film, did his best to lose the Second World War. The less said about it, the better. But Churchill's finest hour on screen is surely darkest hour, directed by Joe Wright and starring Gary Oldman. Many of us enjoyed the privilege of a private screening of this masterpiece last night, and the rapturous applause by an audience of expert Churchillians was a measure of the film's achievement. Through some mysterious alchemy, a potent mix of makeup and otherworldly acting skill, Oldman gives us the greatest and most convincing portrayal of Churchill yet captured on film. And by focusing on the opening weeks of Churchill's wartime premiership, Darkest Hour will remind viewers the world over of Churchill's central role in the saving of Western civilization. We are pleased to have Joe Wright with us this evening and last night, and we wish him and his colleagues every success as they prepare for the film's U.S. opening on November 22nd. 
And thanks to Brad Thompson of Focus Features and Lucas Webb of Working Title Films for seeking the input of Churchills and Churchillians and for making it possible to share the film with all of you. And thanks to Harper Collins for providing a free copy for every attendee of screenwriter Anthony McCartan's nonfiction account of the events of Darkest Hour. It is hard to believe that a year has come and gone since last we met in Washington. During our conference there, we unveiled a new partnership with the National Churchill Museum at Westminster College. We opened the National Churchill Library and Center at the George Washington University, and my appointment to the directorship of the Society and of the Library was announced. Since then, the Society has launched a new and much expanded website, still at www.winstonchurchill.org, featuring content formerly found on the Churchill Central website and elsewhere. Winstonchurchill.org is the premier online source of information about the life and career of Winston Churchill. Visitors also learn about the work of the society and can join and support our organization. One of the benefits of membership is a subscription to Finest Hour, the quarterly journal of Churchill scholarship, finding new and enthusiastic readers under the superb editorship of David Freeman. And our monthly newsletter, Churchill Bulletin, reaches many thousands more. Through these publications, email campaigns, and social media posts on Facebook and Twitter, we reach a vast and worldwide audience. We have engaged in a number of outreach activities, including celebrating Churchill's birthday with the Speaker of the House, and participating in this year's EU Open House at the British Embassy in Washington. Thousands of people attended, and it seemed that most of them stopped by our table to learn more about Churchill and to take a chocolate cigar. Our relationship with Bloomsbury and their online Churchill archive continues. And as uh, happened last year, we ask ICS members with local, state or provincial, or national connections in education to continue to get the message out about the online Churchill archive, available for free to schools in North America, thanks to a generous donation by Lawrence Geller. More than 1,900 schools in more than 100 counties are offering the Churchill Archive to students. The Churchill Archive individual subscription is available to ICS members at a 35% discount over the next three months. Uh, and then an ongoing 25% discount is available after that. This is an unparalleled online resource, and I urge you to consider subscribing. We will also celebrate and promote the upcoming exhibition opening in December, Winston Churchill, A Man for All Seasons, a collaboration between the National Churchill Museum and the Center for the Four Arts in Palm Beach, Florida. We will hold a dinner in honor of the exhibition in Palm Beach in January. We have also established a new and exciting partnership with the Folger Shakespeare Library on Capitol Hill in Washington which will climax with the opening of a grand new exhibition, Churchill Shakespeare, in the autumn of 2018. As we know, Churchill was influenced by a number of gifted writers, including Gibbon and Macaulay. But none had a more profound effect on his development as a prose stylist than did William Shakespeare. His speeches, histories, and everyday speech were marked by Shakespearean allusions and inflections. Churchill's Shakespearean literary instincts even led him to render the reading copies of his speeches in a sort of blank verse. The exhibition will feature about 60 manuscripts and artifacts drawn equally from the unparalleled collections of the Folger and the Churchill Archive Center at Churchill College, Cambridge. Thanks to Andrew Roberts and Alan Packwood for their leadership on this project, and I hope all of you make a point of coming to Washington to see this tribute to two great literary icons. Turning now to the National Churchill Library and Center, 
We have enjoyed great success as a destination for Churchill scholars, students, and the general public. We have expanded our collection of primary and secondary sources, installed the first of a series of temporary exhibits, and launched a permanent display of original art, artifacts, and documents. Thanks to generous loans from the National Churchill Museum, Randolph Churchill, and book dealer Mark Curitz, visitors may now view such treasures as a beautiful painting by Churchill, the wedding gifts given to him by Clementine, documents telling the story of the famed Sinews of Peace speech in Fulton, Missouri, and first editions of his major works. We are proud of our books and treasures, but at the NCLC, we are also mindful of Churchill's insistent question, why do we regard history as of the past and forget that we are making it? Thus, since our opening, we have hosted fascinating programs with leaders such as General David Petraeus, former Pakistani President Pervez Musharraf, former Foreign Secretary Lord Owen, former U.S. Ambassador to the U.K. Matthew Barzin, and others influenced and inspired in their public careers by the life and example of Winston Churchill. And we have hosted distinguished scholars who have studied the nature of leadership and attempted to derive lessons for us today. Lincoln Scholar and former Corpus Christi College Oxford President Richard Carwardine, foreign policy expert Elliot Cohen, Holocaust historian Tim Snyder, and John Meacham have appeared, the latter at a joint event with the White House Historical Association. These events have drawn large audiences, and most have been broadcast on C-SPAN. In the weeks to come, we will welcome royal biographer Sally Bedell Smith, acclaimed novelist Mark Helprin, the new Irish ambassador to the United States, Dan Mulhall, and many others. We have also hosted and shared our resources with the authors of two very important upcoming books, our very own board member, Andrew Roberts, hard at work on what will surely be the definitive single volume biography of Churchill due next fall. And Eric Larson, author of Devil in the White City, who will examine the Churchill family's turbulent first year in Downing Street in a book to be published in 2019. And we are delighted to have both of them here at this conference. The NCLC, will soon be the site of a course on Winston Churchill taught by Professor Dane Kennedy of the George Washington University. College classes on Churchill are far rarer than they should be, and we are pleased to do our part in reaching out to young people about his complex and extraordinary life. And next year, we will host a day-long symposium at the NCLC on the latest Churchill scholarship. So as you can see, we have been busy, and we have many plans. But remembering that Churchill once famously disdained a dessert by declaring, this pudding has no theme. Let me be sure to articulate our three principal aims. One, by surveying the past and engaging with the present, the International Churchill Society seeks to apply the lessons of the life and legacy of Sir Winston Churchill to the challenges of today. We wish to articulate a heroic vision of leadership to which all may aspire in every field of endeavor. We work to educate and inspire the young, including the students we have gathered with us today, for it is upon them and their knowledge of the past that the future depends. Thanks for your support of these endeavors, and I hope we can count on you going forward. For more information about how you can give to the society, Please see me during the conference or get in touch through our website, winstonchurchill.org. Before we turn to the first of our distinguished speakers, let me take a moment to thank a few people without whom this conference would not be possible. Thanks, first of all, to our generous sponsors, especially the Lenny and Corinne Sands Foundation, without whose support we would never have been able to assemble such a glittering array of speakers in this exciting and expensive city. I am also grateful for the leadership of our president, Randolph Churchill, our chairman, Lawrence Geller, and our vice chairman, Jean-Paul Montepay. These gentlemen and the rest of the board of directors 
have given much of their time and their resources, and I am grateful for their kindness and their wise counsel. It has been a tremendous honor over the last year to get to know and rely upon the support of the members of the Churchill family. I'm particularly pleased that Randolph and Jenny Churchill and Celia and Edwina Sands are with us today. Living links to the great man and extraordinary figures in their own right, their unwavering support of the International Churchill Society is appreciated more than I think they know. Finally, I wish to thank our superb ICS team, David Freeman, Justin Reich, John Olson, and Natalie Ellis for their tirelessness and dedication. And thanks also to Pierce Burns for her help as well. Never in the field of Churchill conferences was so much owed by so many <laughs> to so few. Thank you again for being with us and enjoy yourselves today and tomorrow. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we are in the unusual situation of running ahead of schedule at our conference, so we are going to take a brief break and resume promptly at 9.30. <laughs>